Even more than 400 years after her death, the life and legacy of Mary, Queen of Scots, remains fascinating to us. Her personal hardships and political schemes inspired numerous works of fiction, but none could possibly compete with the true story that led to her demise. Today, we're going to take a look at everything that had to happen for Mary, Queen of Scots, to be executed. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other queens you would like to hear about. Now, the meanest hind in fair Scotland may rove their sweets amang, but I, the queen of a Scotland, maun lie in prison strang. Born to King James V of Scotland and his wife and queen consort, Marie de Guise, on December 8, 1542, Mary was the couple's only surviving child. As such, she was heir to the throne when her father died of a sudden illness. She became queen when she was only six days old. While Mary was growing up, Scotland was ruled by a series of regents, one of whom was her mother. When she was eight months old, Mary was betrothed to Prince Edward, the son of King Henry VIII, and heir to the throne of England. The marriage was intended to calm tensions between the two nations, but it had the opposite effect. Scotland's Catholic nobility hated the idea, and the wedding was called off. Given that Mary's father and grandfather had been fighting Henry VIII for decades, her security was always uncertain. So for Mary's protection and to strengthen Scotland's connections with the French, she was promised to Francis, the heir to the French throne. In 1548, Mary went to live in France, where King Henry II would describe her as the most perfect child he'd ever seen. Huh, I wonder how many children he'd seen. She would spend the next 12 years of her life there being honored and served at court and getting an education alongside her future husband, Francis. The two finally tied the knot and sealed the Scottish-French alliance in 1558. In 1559, Francis became King of France and Mary became the Queen. However, King Francis II's reign would come to a relatively quick ending when he passed away suddenly in 1560. Just a year later, French royalty would have Mary returned to Scotland. Mary was a stranger in her native land. As a Catholic, she identified more closely with her French upbringing than she did with her Protestant Scottish heritage. Nonetheless, she made no attempt to push her religion or culture on her subjects and was well received by them. On the other hand, her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, didn't take so well to the returning queen. Elizabeth refused to acknowledge Mary as her successor and their relationship was tense. In 1565, Mary married her cousin, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley. Their union strengthened the Stuart claim to the English throne, and Mary was, at first, fond of Darnley because he was a Catholic. The Protestant nobility, on the other hand, was outraged. Over time, Mary would come to find Darnley arrogant, weak, and immature. She started excluding him from royal matters, and their marriage soured. In June of 1566, Mary gave birth to a son, James. However, despite having finally produced an heir, her relationship with Darnley continued to suffer. Mary considered getting out of the marriage, but such an action could jeopardize the legitimacy of her son and damage her own reputation. It wouldn't be an issue for long, though. The exact circumstances of Darnley's death remain unclear. What we do know is that in February of 1567, Darnley fell ill. Rather than recover in Edinburgh, he decided to travel to the Collegiate Church of St. Mary in the Fields, also known as Kirko Field. Mary did not go with him, which aroused suspicions when, on the morning of February 10th, a gunpowder explosion destroyed the house Darnley was staying in. Darnley was later found dead, but not in the house. The partially clothed bodies of Darnley and one of his servants were discovered in a nearby orchard. They were untouched by the explosion and had apparently been strangled or smothered, who knows, maybe even strangled and smothered. When the explosion happened, Mary was in the company of James Hepburn, Earl of Bothwell. Her political enemies accused the two of murdering Darnley and even put Bothwell on trial in April of 1567. He eventually was acquitted. Just a month later, Mary and James would marry, despite the fact Bothwell already had a wife. According to Claude Now, the Queen's secretary, Bothwell told Mary he was divorced or in the process of getting a divorce. Mary, for her part, claimed Bothwell had abducted her and forced her to marry him. Sounds like they were made for each other. Whatever the case, in the summer of 1567, the wildly unpopular marriage caused Scotland to descend into unrest. 
Bothwell was accused of usurping the crown by both Protestant and Catholic nobility, and when it was all over, he was sent into exile. He eventually fled to Denmark, where King Frederick II had him jailed. Bothwell slowly went mad and eventually died in solitary confinement in 1578. Mary was confined to Loch Leven Castle, and on July 24, 1567, she was forced to abdicate the throne to her infant son, James VI. Her half-brother, James Stuart, Earl of Moray, would rule as regent until James was of age. Mary would spend nearly a year at Loch Leven. It's recorded that while she was there, she had a miscarriage, losing twins who were likely fathered by Bothwell. The cause of her miscarriage was unknown. While a prisoner at Loch Leven, Mary had been under the watchful eye of one Sir William Douglas. Sir William's brother, George, hated the way she was being treated and resolved to free her. On March 25th, Mary swapped clothing with the laundress who regularly visited the castle, and the two women switched places. The queen covered her face and carried some soiled linens to the boat that awaited the laundress. She had nearly gotten away when one of the men on the ship noticed her delicate white hands, which exposed her true identity. Mary was recaptured and the plot's masterminds, George Douglas and his cousin Willie, were expelled from the castle. In what has to be one of the most questionable rehirings in history, Sir William eventually allowed Willie Douglas to return to work at Loch Leven. Always check your new hire references, especially if you're one of them. On the night of May 2nd, 1568, Willie lifted the key to Mary's cell off a drunken Sir William and whisked her from the castle. Mary was then taken by boat to meet George Douglas and several other supporters. Soon, Mary was returned to the company of the more than 6,000 nobles, churchmen, and commoners who were ready to fight for their queen. They got their chance on May 13, 1568, at Langside, when Mary's forces battled Scottish Protestant forces led by James Stuart, 1st Earl of Moray, her half-brother. Half-sibling rivalry. Mary's army was routed in less than an hour. After the defeat at Langside, Mary fled south she initially hoped to find refuge in France with her former mother-in-law, Catherine de Medici. But her odds of making it to France were shaky, and even if she got there, she was disliked in the French court. That left her with only one real option, seek protection from her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I. On May 16, 1568, Mary crossed into England. Despite not being terribly fond of her former daughter-in-law, Catherine de Medici wrote to Elizabeth and implored her to show Mary good and tender treatment. Mary's arrival was met with skepticism. The Earl of Moray named her as an accomplice to the murder of Lord Darnley, and proceedings overseen by Elizabeth were initiated. As an independent sovereign, Mary refused to answer the charges. As a Catholic with a claim to the throne of England, Mary was a particularly dangerous person for Elizabeth to have around. Numerous plots against the English monarch emerged and many appeared to involve her Scottish counterpart. One such conspiracy was the Ridolfi plot of 1571, which apparently involved King Philip II of Spain and the Pope. Named after Roberto Ridolfi, the Florentine banker who carried messages between the major players, the plot aimed to overthrow Elizabeth and put Mary on the throne. It was foiled when one of Ridolfi's messengers was caught in England carrying documents that implicated the Duke of Norfolk, who was eventually executed for treason. There wasn't enough evidence to determine if Mary was directly involved, but she was placed under close watch. The Throckmorton plot of 1583 also aimed to replace Elizabeth with Mary. A Catholic supporter of Mary named Francis Throckmorton used exiled English Catholics to enlist France and Spain in an elaborate plan to rescue England from Protestantism. It's as simple as that. The plotters communicated with Mary, but they were discovered by Elizabeth's secretary, Sir Francis Walsingham. Throckmorton, who was executed for treason in 1584, implicated several of his fellow conspirators, but there still wasn't enough evidence to prove Mary was involved. The Perry Plot of 1585 was yet another conspiracy to place Mary on Elizabeth's throne. The plot was named for its architect, William Perry, who worked for the English government but was accused of being a double agent. He was executed in 1585. Still, there was no evidence Mary had anything to do with it. With so many plots seeking to replace Elizabeth with Mary, legislators decided to act. In 1584, the Privy Council passed the Bond of Association, which pledged that in the event of an attack on Elizabeth, its signers, which ironically included Mary, would kill not only the assassins, but any claimant to the throne in whose name the attack was made. 
Then in 1585, Parliament passed the Act for the Queen's Safety, which negated the rule of any successor involved in a plot against the Crown. Both resolutions were directly addressed to the threat created by Mary, justifying revenge against anyone who endangered Elizabeth and laying the groundwork for her rival's downfall. Finally, in 1586, English authorities uncovered yet another plot to replace Elizabeth with Mary. Known as the Babington Plot, it came to light when Francis Walsingham, a close advisor to the Queen, intercepted a coded letter written by Anthony Babington, a devout Catholic with connections to various French factions. In the letter, Babington informed Mary he had six potential assassins to eliminate Elizabeth. Mary wrote back on July 17th suggesting the assassins might be needed and asking to meet with them. Babington and his associates were sent to the gallows in September of 1586. His letters gave Walsingham the evidence he needed to finally prosecute Mary. Mary's trial began in October of 1586. At first, she refused to appear, but when she was informed it would take place even in her absence, she decided to attend. Mary defended herself by pleading that Elizabeth was not her sovereign and that neither England nor its laws had authority over her. Nonetheless, she was found guilty of treason. Well, it was worth a try. On February 8, 1587, a crowd of hundreds gathered to watch the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. According to observers, she dressed in black, wore a veil, and met her end with bravery. To finish the job, it took three blows from the executioner. Once it was done, the executioner picked up Mary's head, displayed it to those in attendance, and cried out, God save Queen Elizabeth. May all the enemies of the true evangel thus perish. So what do you think? Why is Mary Queen of Scots such a beloved historical figure? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history. Thank you.